explosion of data. And as you saw, we can record from hundreds, thousands of neurons at the same time. And trying to uh, understand what the underlying dynamic and the underlying structure uh, is really the key to understanding brain function. Uh, today I'm going to be telling you about some work done by uh, one of my graduate students, Robert Kim. And it has to do with trying to understand the dynamics of populations of neurons in the prefrontal cortex. We're going to be using reservoir computing, and this has now been very well developed by several groups, uh, including Larry Abbott. Uh, and, and the way it works is that you have a, a recurrent neural network, uh, and you have uh, input units, you have inputs to the uh, recurrent network, and you have outputs. And these uh, connection strengths are, are uh, learnable or fixed. And, uh, and you can get uh, really quite remarkable transformations uh, in terms of the uh, ways to, to force learning algorithm, for example. Uh, and these are continuous, uh, these units have continuous uh, variables that are representing the uh, activity of the each unit. And then there are uh, uh, parameters that have to do with the, uh, the input units U, the output units W, and then the recurrent networks W, uh, J, in this particular diagram. Now, the, the, what we would like to do is to study, uh, uh, unfortunately, what, you, know, you, you can get this network to uh, uh, do a task, but the question is how do you compare it to spiking neurons? So what we'd like to be able to do is to transform one of these recurrent networks with continuous values to one with spiking units. And there are a variety of ways that that can be done, and there's a very nice review paper by Larry uh, was published in Nature Neuroscience uh, a couple of years ago. So Robert, my lab, uh, has discovered a, a, a very simple way of doing this. Uh, and one of, the, one of the motivating principles is to try to uh, reduce the number of units, spiking units, that you need to replicate a continuous unit. A continuous unit is an average firing rate, and if you have a spiking unit that is very sparse in terms of the number of spikes, you, you, you might you know, you get a lot of noise. And so this is typically have many, many more spiking units to represent a continuous uh, network. But Robert was able to show that it is possible to take a re trained recurrent network and be able to replace each of the re continuous units one for one with a spiking unit in order to solve a task. So here's a very simple task. We train a network to take an input simply to integrate it and produce an output that's the integrate the, uh, the area under that uh, pulse. Now, if you replace every unit one for one and keep all the weights the same strength, it doesn't do very well. Uh, in, in fact, uh, it, it, there's a tremendous amount of variability. Uh, it's chaotic. However, if you reduce the strength of each of the units uh, in, in the uh, recurrent network and also on the output, <laughs> Then you can reproduce the output uh, very accurately. Uh, you have to reduce the strength by a factor of 50, 5, 0. Now, why would that be? Well, an average firing rate is a number that extends over the whole interval. For example, 100 milliseconds. Well, uh, when you have a spike, that spike occurs at a single time. But if you, if you want that to represent an average over the interval, you've got to reduce the strength. So that it gives you an average. And it turns out a factor of 50 is just about right. And, and this is very robust. We have a paper in PNAS which uh, gives all the details. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really remarkable. I, I would have never guessed that if this could be done so simply. But now we'd like to use this new approach to try to uh, look at a particular uh, task that monkeys have been, uh, the kind of task that a monkey would, would want to be able to do to be trained. Uh, and so here's, here's a, uh, a, a task, it's a temporal exclusive or task, where you've got two stimuli that come in at two different times. If the two stimuli are both positive or both negative, then you should, uh, the output should be positive. 
but if they have opposite sign, the output should be negative. And so we trained up a network to do this. We also, by the way, uh, made each of the time constants for each of the units trainable. And here's the uh, histogram of the time constants that were needed to, to solve that problem. We could also, now having trained it, uh, as you can see, it's doing pretty well. We can look at the trajectory, and, and when it reaches the first uh, input, you can see that that trajectory separates according to whether it's positive or negative to the right or the left. And then similarly, when you come to the second stimulus, it will also separate uh, in the third dimension, which is the one that is responsible for the output. So, th so it's, it's for small networks like this, we can interpret it uh, fairly well using dynamical methods. So now comes the monkey data. This is uh, from a, a public data set from Constant, Constant Elitis uh, here uh, at all, which consisted of 388 recorded neurons from four monkeys doing a working memory task, which is delayed batch to sample. So the task consists of uh, a fixation period, a stimulus comes on, and then uh, there's a delay period of a second and a half, and then the sample comes up and it's either in the same position or a different position, and if it's in the same position, the monkey moves inside one direction, if it's in a different position, moves it in a different direction. So it's, it has to remember where the stimulus was uh, and then to uh, re uh, respond appropriately. So here is our uh, DMS task for the uh, exactly the same uh, procedure. Here is what the network looks like after it's been trained up. Uh, exclusive OR is not a difficult uh, computation. It's, it's a very simple uh, logical computation. But what makes this difficult is that, uh, of course, there's a delay period. So you have to hold on to the information in order to make the comparison. Uh, so we, uh, and also in these networks, I should say that we, we separated excitatory inhibitory neurons to keep it constrained by what we see in the cortex, 80% excitatory, 20% inhibitory. And, uh, and, and so uh, you, you can see that it's able to produce an output that is appropriate. Okay, now we want to compare the uh, properties of the neurons in our recurrent network with the recorded ones. And the one simple uh, measure is to look at the uh, binned spike autocorrelation. So we have uh, 50 trials. Uh, and what we, we do is bin them 50 millisecond bins and just count the number of spikes per bin. And then we take, uh, if, if we want to look at the autocorrelation over, say, 100 milliseconds, we, we compare the first bin with the uh, third bin, we or multiply them together, uh, and then we move the, the pair uh, across the entire uh, 100 milliseconds so that we're computing an average autocorrelation with a time delay of 100 milliseconds. And we repeat that for 150 milliseconds and 200 milliseconds and so forth. And as you can see, in this particular, for this particular network, uh, we can fit an exponential to it, and it has a decay of about a uh, time constant of 177 milliseconds. And now, uh, this is for a uh, train network. Let's compare it to the uh, experimental recordings. And in order to make a comparison, uh, uh, first of all, look at the uh, histogram here of, of the, for each unit uh, in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, what was their autocorrelation. And you can see there's a, a median here of about 100 milliseconds and there's a broad peak. Uh, and there are many fewer that are shorter. And uh, similarly, when we trained up the network to do the same task, uh, it had qualitatively similar distribution of median of 122 milliseconds. If we just take an on-train network off the shelf, uh, we have a, a very different distribution where they're mainly small uh, time scales uh, and very few long ones. Now, we also wanted to compare uh, two groups, uh, short group and the uh, long group. And so we're going to separate them into the, the short ones, which is the ones that were uh, in, the, the, in the first third of the uh, intervals, and then the long ones for the, uh, the, the third uh, third. And then uh, you can see the uh, shorts uh, for the uh, recurrent network in the dynamic and the uh, prefrontal cortex recordings were on the order of 68, 69 milliseconds, which is 
comparable, and same for the uh, long the group. It's 133, 131. So you know, it's interesting that we have a way to to sort of see the distribution, not just one time constant, but to look at the distribution. And it's known from other studies that if you look earlier in the cortex, uh, in the sensory processing streams, that you uh, say D4, that uh, you typically get only these short time intervals. So it looks as if the prefrontal cortex has these particularly long ones compared to the, uh, the early sensory cortex. Now we can do another uh, test which has to do with discriminability. Uh, and what we do here is we look at the uh, units in the network and we compare them across all pairs to see how well they discriminate between the two different conditions, right? And, and, uh, and so we look, can look at that as a function of time, uh, as you can see here, and, uh, and we can compare the two groups, the short and the long, and uh, the high discriminability here is yellow and red, and you can see that for the short group, there's not much information during the delay period, that's the critical one. During the stimulus period, yeah, there's a little bit of uh, data here about separating up, but surprisingly little. But for the long time constants, uh, you, you have uh, a, a information not just about during this, when the stimulus is there, but also uh, during the delay period. And this is also shows up uh, if you look at the average as a function of time across all of the units. And you can see that there is, uh, comparing the long and the short, uh, that uh, they're able to discriminate between the two uh, as a function of time. Uh, so this, this, is, this is the data from the prefrontal cortex uh, showing you know, that there's a lot of information there that's being held in working memory. So here's the same uh, uh, discriminability calculation done for the recurrent network and you can see that uh, interestingly there is information here in both the short and the, and the, and the long. But uh, this, the key thing though is during the uh, delay period there's a lot of information there. Okay, now, <clears throat> the working memory means you have to remember something over time. Let's look at a simpler task, which is alternating forced choice. And here you don't have to have any memory because uh, as soon as the cue comes, you either press the button, it's positive or negative, right? So it's an, it's, it doesn't require memory. And if you train up a network uh, with alternating forest choice, you hear you get a distribution of time scales that has a much bigger peak here at the smaller time scales. In fact, the median is 43, which is much lower than it is for the, uh, the other uh, uh, task that requires a, a, a memory, working memory. And uh, you know, also, we can now look at the uh, strengths of the inhibition. And now here, is, this is now getting to the core of the <laughs> issue here. We have this recurrent network, we trained it up, it works, what have we learned? And now, with the spiking network, we can actually go in and, and figure it out. And I'm going to show you now, for the rest of the talk, what we discovered. So first of all, the inhibitory strengths uh, were very different in these two different networks. The delayed match of sample had much stronger uh, inhibitory strengths. And by the way, there are, there are connections between the inhibitory units as well as between the, the excitatory and inhibitory units and the excitatory and excitatory. And, uh, one of the things that we wanted to test was what, if we disrupted those connections, uh, how would the time scale change? And uh, basically, uh, it turns out that the only set of connections that are disrupted, if you, uh, if you shuffle them, is the eye to eye, in, which is interesting. So it's not the uh, interactions between E and I that are the critical ones for maintaining the time scale. Somehow, the eye to eye, that, that, that the sub, uh, network within the recurrent network seems to be particularly important. And, uh, and you can see that uh, in, in the case where the eye to eye are disrupted, the discriminability score goes way down. So this is really important. These connections are really important for solving the task. So we went further and we manipulated the strengths. So we, we either increase the strength or decrease it by 30%. And you can see that the time scale really depended on that strength. So if you decrease the time scale, if you decrease the strength, the time scale plummets. You saw that on the last slide. But if you increase it, it actually goes up. 
uh, and the task accuracy similarly uh, in the same direction. Now, here's where it really gets interesting. So let's take each inhibitory neuron and decide whether it is responding primarily to the uh, input that is positive or negative. So this is a score of R positive minus R negative divided by the sum. And so it's between minus one and plus one. And, uh, and if it's uh, plus one, it's all, it's primarily positive and it's negative one, it's primarily negative. And you can see there's a distribution here, but you can separate them. And we can also look at this, their strengths. And we can now uh, look at what happens when we disrupt uh, either within a group or between groups. So this is this little icon here where you have this little recurrent connection it means we've disrupted it within the group and if there's only, uh, if now between the subgroups uh, is, is shown with this little icon and what you can see is that the inhibitory strength here uh, when it is decreased by 30 percent, uh, when it is yeah, decreased by 30 percent within the group it really affects the, uh, the task accuracy much more than uh, across subgroups. So this is telling us that there's something important about those subgroups. And so this gives rise to a hypothesis about what's really going on in this network. It's basically disinhibition. So here's the input uh, to, uh, to both subgroups. Uh, and let's say that the input comes into this, uh, the, the, the dark subgroup and starts activating these inhibitory neurons. Well, these inhibitory neurons in subgroup one, negative, are going to inhibit the other subgroup. And when this is inhibited, it's going to disinhibit the excitatory neurons for, for this uh, set of uh, excitatory neurons. And during the delay period, that actually increases in firing strength. And vice versa when the input activates primarily this subgroup. So this is an interesting. Uh, concept because previous models of working memory, and there are a couple of them which are reasonable ones, but the, the, the Xiao Jing Wang had a very nice model in which it was the strengths of positive excitatory connections between pyramidal cells that were responsible for maintaining an upstate. This is a very different one. It's, mean, it's, it's telling us that the inhibitory cells may be structured and that they have little compact subgroups. And that, uh, if you look at the logic here, this is a flip-flop circuit, basically, figuring out which of the subgroups is, has the most activity. And of course, this could be generalized from two to more subgroups. Now, we, there's something else that uh, was really interesting. And again, it wasn't something we expected. So we have spikes. So we can look at variability of the spikes. And there are two you know, types of uh, variability. Uh, in the low variability case, uh, from trial to trial, we talk about trial to trial variability. If it's low, uh, then the phantom factor is going to be low. Uh, here we're looking at the total number of spikes across trials. Variance is 0.5, and that has a low phantom factor, variance over mean. However, if there's high variability, if sometimes you get a lot of spikes, and sometimes no spikes, and sometimes one or two spikes, phantom factor is much higher. And what we found was that uh, the, it not only was the FANO factor uh, really quite uh, high in, in these networks, as you'll see, but it also was highly correlated with the autocorrelation. The higher the FANO factor, the higher the autocorrelation. So here's the data from the uh, prefrontal cortex showing the distribution of FANO factors and comparing uh, for the, both the short and the long. Uh, and here you can see that uh, comparing the short and the long, uh, the, the, the long, there, there's more longs uh, than there are shorts. I mean, for, for uh, high phantom factors. And similarly, if you look at the recurrent network, it's even more obvious that uh, the, the longs really have the highest phantom factor. So it means that the, uh, these uh, inhibitory neurons that are responsible for uh, being able to carry the information forward in time have a, a tremendously high uh, fluctuation in terms of the trial to trial variability, which is actually seen in recordings from inhibitory neurons in the prefrontal cortex. Several groups have reported this, which is, which is you know, otherwise, what would it mean if you just saw that? In fact, it, my interpretation would be to say, well, the inhibitory neurons must not be important if, if sometimes they have a high activity and low activity. 
Well, you have to look at all the neurons and you have to see how they're interacting in order to understand what's, what, what that means. Uh, and, and now just to, to do it quantitatively, here is the family factor as a function of time scale uh, for both the uh, prefrontal cortex and the recurrent network, and, and they're both very highly significant. So this is, and you can see that, was, that, that there is not, so this is the trend, but uh, there is variability in the variability. Okay, so let's ask the question of what's driving the variability. And again, uh, what we can do is to uh, manipulate uh, by plus or minus 30% the strengths of all the connections in the different groups. And the only one that changes the phantom factor is the eye to eye group. So it really is the eye to eyes. Eyes, the eyes have it, eyes to eyes. That's, that's, it's really interesting. I mean, you know, it means that we, we've been ignoring, we've been paying attention to all these pyramidal cells, you know, the, the power hitters, and we've been ignoring the, 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 the you know, the, 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 the inhibitory cells, which really are the ones that are uh, calling the shots, in, at least in this particular rec recurrent network. Uh, and here's what it looks like for a particular cell, a particular inhibitory neuron. Again, comparing the, the normal one from the network with the increased 30% uh, or decreased 30%. And you can see it becomes much more sparse as you increase the in inhibitory, to inhibitory inhibition. And also, for this particular neuron, you can see how, how it affects the phantom factor. It's, it's very dramatic. Uh, so, how much time do I have left here? I think I have about th three minutes. Okay, well, this is going to go quickly. Uh, so, and the, and the, but this is equally important for understanding what's going on in prefrontal cortex. So, the, the group, Constantinidis, uh, in, before they actually trained it on the uh, delay match a sample, trained it, simply gave it the passive stimulus and the, and, and the animal was trained to keep fixation. And if you look at the uh, correlations, and if you look at the uh, discriminability and the time scale, they were identical across uh, passive versus the, 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 after training on delayed <coughs> match sample. And uh, the violin plots here have you know, the same median and the same distribution, which means that the, you know, the, 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 the prefrontal cortex, the, the, the long time delays were not tr trained in the way that we did in our current network, but long time delays were already there. And we can, t t we can also train up on the passive task, which we did. And we uh, show here that uh, we are, are able to uh, see a difference between positive and negative cues. Uh, when we retrain, first we retrained on the pa on passive task, and then we retrained on the delayed match of sample, and the distribution of the inputs changed, and, and so did the uh, distribution of the time constants uh, and discriminability. Now here's, here's where there's a, a dissociation, okay? In our recurrent network, if we train first on the delayed match to sample, and then retrain, but only changing the input strings on the, uh, the forced choice task, we can get up to 100% performance, right? So that's interesting because we already preloaded it with the long time constants. But what if we do it the opposite way? We train on the uh, forced choice task and then try to retrain it, changing only these strings on the, on the delayed batch of sample. And you can see you never get above chance unless you increase the strengths of the eye-to-eye -eye connection. So you increase those by 30%, and, and you can get up to about 65, 70%. So that's interesting. So one of, the, one of the interpretations here may be that prefrontal cortex becomes preloaded with these long time constants, and you don't have to make changes within the recurrent networks. Those are already there. And now you can, you can, depending on the task, just by changing the, uh, the upstream in, uh, inputs, you can get the very same network to do several different tasks. So that's, that makes the uh, training a lot easier. And finally, uh, there's some interesting evidence for this kind of a mechanism in the barn owl. In, the, uh, of, of, in fact, it's the uh, attention circuit in the uh, superior colliculus. So the superior colliculus it's an area, it, it's, it actually is called the optic tectum in the birds, but 
it's an area that controls uh, your attention of what you're, where you're looking in space. And in the case of primates, uh, you stimulate up in the in the map, and you will get a, a saccadic eye movement. And it was known that if you record from uh, in the barn owl from this particular area in the optic tectum, and uh, with the stimulus at a particular location, you get a nice re receptive field. In this case, it's uh, located here about five degrees to the right. But now, if you stimulate, if, if you give it the very same stimulus, but in addition, stimulate the surround, uh, what you do is you knock down the central response to you know, lower than 75%, you reduce the response, which suggests that there's a huge uh, inhibitory surround. And we actually know the anatomy, so it turns out that there, here's the optic tectum, this is the top layer, the visual layer, here's the motor layer on the bottom. And it turns out that you know, there's inputs to this, uh, it's a, a, a deep nucleus here, uh, which is a magnocellular nucleus, which then projects very broadly in, with inhibitory connections up to that motor area, which could account for this re reduction. And also to another area, it's an isthmian uh, parvocellular uh, nucleus, which has cholinergic projections that are topographic which are very uh, enhanced. It's a neuromodulator that increases the activity uh, uh, of, the, of, of neurons by uh, activating metabo metabolic uh, uh, receptors, cholinergic receptors. So, so this is, in a sense, they, they call this the donut model because you know, you're, you're inhibiting everything around the center of a two-dimensional surface. Uh, but you can imagine that you can have even much more complex topologies if you have a bunch of units in columnar organization, and now how are they in influencing each other across the columns? Okay, uh, just the, la the last note, if you think there's something strange about the uh, optic tectum of the bird, uh, it turns out that in mammals we have almost exactly the same structures, but they have different names. Uh, this is the uh, parabigeminal nucleus, which is like the the uh, IPC, and uh, you have similar uh, uh, layered structure within the spirit colliculus. And by the way, be before the cortex appeared, uh, this was the primary way that uh, uh, you know, sub, sub mammalian species actually uh, integrated information about the world and decided whether they're going to uh, you know, uh, either approach or, or go away from a particular target. Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I want to thank uh, Robert for the great work he's done. Question? Yes, go ahead. Thank you so much.